So this is our last week of new work. Yay? Not yay? The last week of, this is the last new topic. Yay. The last new stuff you have to learn, yay. Look, if, if you're less than impressed, I can add one more topic. Add one more. I'll add one more topic. <laughs> so the sun, is, hence the image here, the uh, sun is setting on the audit. So we're going to look at completing the audit and wrapping it up today and then giving our final audit opinion. Two things that I, I need to make official notices for. The first one is, who's coming back next year to keep going on their degree? Well, I'm not, I'm coming back next year. Um, hopefully none of you will be coming back to auditing next year and you'll be moving on to other subjects. But I just wanted to reassure everybody that we have the balanced sessions or semesters. The autumn, semest uh, the autumn session actually starts, and it's quite late, on the 21st of March. Yeah, I know. We usually start, I think, the last week of Feb or the first week of March. So the winter break is now a lot smaller than it used to be. Um, so Monday, the 21st of March. But what you need to do in the preparation week, which is the week starting March 14, is log on to UTS Online. Um, and you know how you guys, uh, this term, you saw the landing page when you first logged on and there was like some videos to watch. There was me introducing myself and what we were going to do, the subject outline, um, a little quiz for you to do and a video of what some students thought about the subject. Each accounting major subject will have one of those little landing pages. There might be a little preparation quiz or some prerequisite knowledge for you to refresh. So the preparation week is some things to do to get ready. And then on Monday the 21st of March, you hit the ground running. So the old days of, you remember some subject coordinators come in and all they talk about in the first week is what's in the subject outline? We're not going to be doing, well, they shouldn't be doing that anymore. So we go straight into content at full speed in week one because the landing page and the preparation week is where you're meant to do all of those different things. Um, there's also, now, the first semester preparation week is actually two weeks because it starts on the 7th of March. Uh, with traditional O week. So all the free activities around at the university, which is part-time students you never get to indulge in. I remember what that was like. Um, all of those activities will still be on. And then you go into the preparation week, which is doing some work online. It could be watching videos or doing some little quizzes. And then hit the ground running um, in the actual first week of term on the 21st of March. So. If you're thinking of going on a holiday, we've got a little bit more time to do that, uh, but we're starting a bit later. Now, I want to reinforce that with the balance sessions, there are now three official semesters or sessions per year. You are not forced to go to summer school or summer session. Right? Not all subjects will run in summer session. I haven't taught summer session for about nine years um, because my son, well, now, Daycare gets closed over the summer, so I need to do that. Um, but most students, we would recommend, still do autumn and semester um, programs, finish their degree in three years. Um, and especially for those students who will be just starting, we won't recommend that they accelerate their degrees because our preference is that you go out and you do a, an internship or something or you go on exchange to so give yourself plenty of time. The next thing is the student feedback survey. Please fill them in. Thank you to the two people so far who have filled one in. Um, so make sure you do that. Also on UTS Online, I just released it a couple of days ago, there's an extra little survey in your video interview folder. Um, and that was just, we want your feedback on how you found the software. If you're Sam, you'll say, my god, this thing drove me crazy. <laughs> um, but you know, we'd like to know if you thought it was useful. Um, was this better than, for example, doing the class presentations? So if you could do the video interview instead of a class presentation, would you do that instead? Um, so we'd love your thoughts and feedback about that. Um, and that'll help us decide whether I want to keep doing it next year or what we might do instead. So, um, and whether you think it's useful. I know that uh, I think somebody, uh, must be somebody who works uh, full-time said, oh, look, I've already got a job, so doing a video interview is probably not something that it would ever help me. 
But then some of our people who are, have not got to that grad job stage yet have said, oh, yeah, you know, I had to do one of these and I was really nervous, so this gave me some good practice. So we want to know what you think, um, and the more people that fill it out, the better. Um, the video interview survey, if you do it, there's actually three gift cards up for grabs, um, $50 gift cards, and you can nominate where you want the gift card to come from. So you fill it in, and um, in the day lecture, we'll draw it, and if it's somebody from the night class, I'll make an announcement on Facebook so you can see if you're a winner. Okay, um, now throughout the term, I've been drawing the context diagrams. Right, each week to sort of show us where we fit within the whole process. Do you want me to do one of those today for our last topic? Yes? Okay, so I'm going to start for a change at the beginning because I normally start at the end of, with the audit report and we work backwards. So today I'm actually going to start at the beginning, which according to Maria is a very good place to start. So, nobody got my... Sound of Music reference? Oh. Deary me. I won't start singing the Sound of Music, so don't worry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Has everybody seen the Sound of Music? No. Oh, okay. One of those classic movies, that Singing in the Rain, definitely. So we start with the engagement letter, right? The engagement letter is that contract between the auditor and the client and it sets out what we're supposed to do. So what are we supposed to do? Our job, auditor's job, ensure the financial statements are free from material misstatements. Okay. All right, so the engagement letter very clearly sets out the auditor's job. We need to make sure they're free from material misstatements. And so that brings up a few different questions. The first one is, what is this idea of materiality? How do I figure out what it is? And then the second question is, how do I find these material misstatements? How do I know where to look? I need to gather some evidence. So let me just start drawing some lines here. All right. So I have my engagement letter, my little document. And that tells me this is what the auditor's job is. Obviously, from there, there's this idea about what is material. So we need to consider the idea of materiality. So to figure out how the heck I'm going to do my audit and how I'm going to detect these material misstatements, the very first thing I need to do is understand the client. Can anyone remember what ASA that is? Yes! 10 points. That was my very bad Eurovision reference. All right, so I have to understand the client. All right, and understanding the client requires me to think about two things the level of inherent risk and trying to identify exactly what the hell those inherent risks are and they can be because of industry or company structure. And then I also need to think about the control risk. All right, and when we looked at control risk, we looked at a couple of different things. So let me just draw some more lines in here. So we need to understand the client. Part of that comes from my that generates me some inherent risks, and that also generates some control risks. And when we identified the control risks, we looked within our internal control pyramid, where we looked at different components of risk. So that feeds in there. Now, once I've got my inherent risk and my control risk, what the heck do I do with it? I use it in something. What do I use it in? The audit risk model. Fantastic. So. I use my audit risk model to help me determine my audit strategy. All right, so these things feed into here. All right, and so that gives me my strategy. And I've got two sorts of strategy. I can take the substantive approach to my audit, 
or I could take the controls approach to my audit. All right, and uh, in one of my Amanda Loves to Audit videos, I talk about how you know, we always need to do some assessment of internal controls, um, and depending on the level of detection risk, that will help determine how much substantive testing I do and how much controls testing I do. And so that stuff, doing those things, gives me a whole lot of audit evidence. Actually, I've sort of skipped a step. Let me just put that up here. Okay, so my tests give me, or my strategy, actually, results in me designing audit programs. Oops. And those audit programs, put that down there, give me use of oh, different procedures and our assertions to generate our audit evidence. So let me draw some lines in here. So my different types of strategies, whatever I do goes into my program that says here's my recipe. My programs actually detail what procedures or what assertions I might use to allow me to generate some audit evidence. Okay. All right. And that audit evidence as part of those procedures, I'll think about my materiality, um, my procedures as well. I'll think about sampling because I can't you know, get everything. I need to determine whether my evidence is sufficient and appropriate. So I use that evidence and my materiality to identify, are there any material misstatements? All right, we're looking for dollar value errors in the accounts or insufficient disclosures. Then I negotiate with management and the final output, let me change the color here, let's use purple, is my audit report, which contains in it my audit opinion. And uh, I'm okay if you guys use those terms interchangeably, audit report, audit opinion, that's okay at this level. All right, so let me just change that one to red. I'll draw in some lines here. Bless you, I think. Okay, now there's a whole lot of things that happen in between finding our list of errors and coming up with the audit opinion and they don't sort of fit in many places so I'm just going to sort of put them over here on the side. I'm going to do them in orange and there's a few things that we have to do at the end of the audit. All right, so one of those things is we negotiate the adjustments that managers are going to make. We also need to assess going concern. We need to evaluate any subsequent events and I'll talk about those. Uh, we need to consider our documentation, make sure we've appropriately documented before we go ahead and do the audit opinion. So it's sort of a bit like this. And these things here don't fit anywhere else. Well, it's no point in assessing going concern right here at the beginning when I'm still learning about the client. Right? I bet it's better that I know about all the adjustments that might need to be made, really understand the company before I do these decisions. Now, in terms of what I think students find is the most difficult, I'll give you a little inside tip here, it's this one, evaluating the subsequent events, and this one, coming up with the correct audit opinion. Going concern is, is pretty easy, there's some good uh, tools within ASA 570, Subsequent events and audit opinions require you to have a really thorough understanding of the auditing standard and how it's written. So this is the week where we're going to get back into a lot of referencing. And next week when you do your homework, for every single one of your answers, I want you to make sure you've got a reference to a relevant paragraph within the standard supporting um, your choices. Because these standards 
can be a little bit tricky to read. Um, so it's really important that you have a read of them before you get to the exam. Um, certainly, some students think, oh, yeah, I've, I've watched Amanda's video, and then you think you know it, and you get into the exam, you have a little panic attack. Oh, quick, let me look at the standard to make sure I know what I'm doing. And if it's the first time you look at it, it's like trying to read a completely different language, um, especially the subsequent event standard. It's quite tricky, and there's a lot of technical stuff in there. So that's where we're going today. We're focusing on this sort of little bit here and this bit. So some of the stuff... I won't go into detail on the slides because it is pretty basic and you can read about it. And that way I'm going to spend more time, sorry, on the evaluating subsequent events and audit opinion stuff. So I'm going to focus the lecture on the things that I think are the most difficult. All right, basic learning objectives. When we uh, do the end of the audit, one of the key things we need to do, and this is uh, something that uh, someone will organise, make sure that any remaining audit procedures are checked. Most of the time we use audit software that allows us to automatically check which parts of the accounts have been audited, are there any procedures that have not been completed, are there any work papers that have not been reviewed by somebody. Um, the audit partner determines if procedures have been executed correctly. And the reason that the partner does this is because the partner is the person who signs the audit report. Their actual name goes on it and that creates liability for them. So it's their responsibility to make sure that everything is correct. Now that doesn't mean that your audit partner is going to sit there on the couch at night going through 1,200 audit work papers to make sure you've done them correctly. He does, he or she does rely on the manager or senior managers of the team to check basic work of juniors, but the audit partner might look at the areas that are most at risk, intangible assets, related party transactions, any fraudulent um, transactions that might have come up. So they've usually got a few areas where they tend to focus and then delegate some of the easier stuff like auditing, making sure the audit for cash was done correctly to managers or senior managers on the job. Um, we also need to make sure that uh, we've done everything correctly. Uh, we've considered all necessary matters. So at the beginning of the audit, if you had identified some inherent risks, oh, there's a big risk around revaluation of a brand or an intangible, did we actually go back and look at that on the audit? And then uh, number four is an interesting one. Remove unnecessary documentation for legal purposes. All right, so you, especially if you, you, know, you make a decision and then you change your mind and you make a different decision, um, often you need to remove that documentation from the work paper because if something does go wrong, and you did say, you did originally flag an issue and then you changed your mind on it, that sort of gives the prosecution extra ammunition that maybe you were influenced or you've made the wrong decision. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, sometimes when we have multi-location audits, now that could be within Australia. So you might have you know, Sydney, WA, etc., or it could be overseas as well. You might need to look at documents from other auditors. This happens a lot with multinationals. You rely on smaller audit firms in Fiji and Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands and Vietnam to audit subsidiaries in those countries and then send you their opinion about whether the accounts in those countries are correct, the finalised accounts, so that you can audit the consolidation part on your end. Number six is sort of the same as number four. Those are the same things there, really. And then the last one is to go back and to reconsider the materiality. We set the materiality in the beginning at the planning stage, but circumstances change. We find out new information on the audit all the time. Typically, if we do need to change our materiality, materiality tends to go down. It doesn't ever tend to increase. But as we find more risk, materiality does, does tend to drop a little bit. So we may find more risk at the client, which means that overall we're interested in more and smaller misstatements. Uh, we need to make sure that we've gone back and looked at our internal control assessments. Those were all correct. Make sure we've checked all our planning documentation. The subsequent events procedures we're actually going to get to in its own little section under ASA 560. This is tricky. That bit's really quite tricky. 
But the key is I have to decide whether there is sufficient and appropriate evidence upon which to base my audit opinion. All right. Now, can anyone remember what ASA, the idea of sufficient appropriate evidence, comes from? 500. So ASA 500 says we must have sufficient. What does sufficient mean? Enough. 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 Yep. So sufficient is the idea of do we have enough? All right. And that sort of brings in ASA 530 on sampling. And then appropriate means have I got the right sorts of information? All right. So is my information of a high quality? Is it pervasive? Is, is it persuasive? Is it telling me the right things? All right. So if I'm vouching for, a, I want to make sure that if I'm testing occurrence, I'm doing some form of vouching, and the documents I'm looking at are appropriate. So I need to evaluate my evidence to decide whether the assessment of the risk of material misstatement at the assertion level is appropriate. That is, is there a high, medium, or low risk that the occurrence of sales is appropriate? Or you know, is it a high, medium, or low risk over the accuracy of cost of goods sold? So we look back at those, and if there's a lot of risk, you hope that there is a lot more evidence. The evidence is a greater level uh, is more appropriate. If it's a low risk account, you could probably get away with less evidence or more analytical procedures for that particular account. The key here is that the audit team discusses progress throughout the engagement. So communication, any auditors in the crowd? One, soon to be. Um, but if you're going on a vacation or an internship in auditing, most teams have a team meeting in the morning. Here's what we found yesterday. Here are some things that we need to think about today. Allocate the work out. If you have any issues, come back to the manager. And then typically at the end of the day, you might do a bit of a recap. Oh, look, I found this error in sales. I think that could also be affecting inventory. Um, so we always have continuous discussion because what I find in one account may affect the audit of another. 16 people. My gosh, we could hit 20. If this keeps going on, we could hit 20 people tonight which would be a record. Um, but there's always discussion because every part of the audit affects something else. If I find an error or I find a hidden clause in a remuneration contract and when I'm looking at executive compensation, that might affect how the company maintains its ratios or manages away from certain debt covenants. So everything is always important. And one of the tough things for auditors is to keep track of all this information about the entire firm to make sure that any, if any of it indicates a higher risk of misstatement, we're using that information to look further, to search more, to determine whether there are any errors. So what happens when I find a misstatement or a deviation? Um, so remember, misstatements are related to dollar value errors, and deviations are related to the control is not is not working. All right. So when I look at those, and I've mentioned this before, one of the key things to find out why the heck did it happen? Oh gosh, you know, Amanda was doing the accounting that week without her glasses because she broke them. So all of her transactions are a bit out because her typing was bad because she couldn't see what was on the screen. Or, oh geez, no, we found a problem in the uh, program of how we calculate customer discounts. And you know we've incorrectly calculated the discount for all those people. So I need to figure out what's the reason because knowing what the reason is affects your decision on what to do with other procedures and what you're gonna do with more, if you're gonna do more audit testing. So that could be important and it may affect your materiality if you find errors, obviously. Uh, as we mentioned before, that when we do find errors, materiality is going down. So examples of some things, we might have you know, changes in debt covenants, um, we might have new circumstances or you know, it could be civil uprising in the country where the company has a mine or a facility, all of those things could increase the risk. All right, going concern. Going concern 
comes from, let me choose blue here, ASA 570. Um, and management must assess going in concern according to the AASBs. So they say, management, you have to make an assessment about going concern, and my job as the auditor is I am checking that their assessment is appropriate. All right. Now, under traditional uh, accounting principles, we have this idea that going concern is the ability of the company to continue indefinitely into the future. However, when we're thinking from an accounting and audit perspective, we say 12 months from the director's report. Right. They have to use the information available at the time. Uh, so, you know, no going back with the DeLorean and using the uh, Australian Financial Review to predict company failure. Nobody gets my Back to the Future reference? Jeez, great, Scott. <laughs> we need to integrate 80s, you know, <laughs> early movie culture into uh, <laughs> the audit education curriculum. But I can only use the information at the time of the assessment. So management can only make their assessment with what they know now. If the company collapses because circumstances change after that, it's not management's fault for saying, yes, we think the company will survive when it does, in fact, collapse. And a lot of people got caught out with that the global financial, the subprime crisis, because everyone thought it was good, and then in about six weeks, the financial markets went to crap. So people were saying, hang on a second, the auditors and the managers said two months ago or three months ago everything was fine. It was technically fine at that point in time with the information that they had. So management need to make that assessment, and then my job is to look at the reasonableness of management's assessment. Right? So it sort of means that I almost go back and I do it again. I look at the assumptions they make. Oh, yeah, we're going to be uh, going concerned because we're going to make a 50% increase in market share on the smartphone market. And I'm going to go, unless that smartphone can fold my laundry and teach my two-year-old how to toilet drain, then I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. So we need to look at whether the assumptions they make um, the goals that they've set themselves are appropriate in there. And I give an assessment about whether management are telling the right thing for 12 months from the date of my audit report. Um, so that's quite important. Now, if, and I suggest everybody read ASA 570, and also flag the diagram in the appendices. All right. So there is a flow diagram in the appendices of ASA 570 that actually give you the how to assess going concern guide for auditors. All right. Great diagram. Flag that one. Um, because if you ever get stuck, that tells you exactly what you need to do, what you need to check, who you need to talk to, what you need to do in terms of the audit. So that is really self-explanatory. It's really nice and neatly packaged within the ASA. So that flow diagram is fantastic. Um, if what happens if the company thinks it's going to close? If the going concern is not appropriate, then I have to prepare my financial report on liquidation basis or salvage value basis. What would I get if I sold everything right now today? All right. And that becomes very difficult for the auditor to audit because especially for custom built items, like if we tried to sell all these chairs, lecture theatre chairs, I'm not sure tomorrow if there'd be a lot of people interested in buying them. It's not like there's big lecture theatres being built around the place. I'm pretty sure the University of New South Wales or Sydney wouldn't be interested. Um, I think it's Curtin University just closed its campus here in Sydney, so they're offloading all of their stuff. So sometimes if we have to audit on liquidation values, that can be really tricky. All right, this is the hard one. Um, so let me just pick a different colour. I'll use orange. Okay, subsequent events. Actually, I'm going to change something because there's something I don't agree with here. Okay, so the financial report is based upon events up to and conditions existing at the end of the year. But then there are three other key dates. And I'm actually going to change this because the key dates here are not the key dates that are in the auditing standard, and that's the bit that matters. So, oops, cross that out. I meant to change this before the uh, start of term. I totally forgot it was there until I saw it 
in the day lecture. But the three key dates are the end of the financial period, year or fin it's usually year, but I'll, I'll write financial period there. All right, so that's, that's your replacement there for that one. Um, the date of the auditor's report and the date the financial report is publicly released. All right, now I'm going to draw a little diagram here that shows you a timeline of how all that puts together. Okay, so this is time. And this is our 30th of June, end of the financial year. So typically, what we're interested in is all the transactions that happen in here, all right, and balances at this date. Because we're not reporting on this point in time, all right. But a subsequent event is an event that occurs between the end of the year and back here um, that may have an impact on the actual set of financial statements. Okay? I'm going to break my subsequent events into two types and I'm going to go over those on the next slide. All right, type 1 subsequent events and type 2 subsequent events. So let me draw a line. Okay. I draw a lot of timelines in subsequent events and you'll see there's two YouTube videos on this. Um, I really strongly recommend you watch them. Students tend to I have a flow diagram and I'm sort of going to summarize a little bit here. Um, but uh, watching those videos will really help you with the homework. So that's our end of financial period. All right. So this here is the year that we audit. A type one subsequent event, I'm going to do this in particular colors. Let's do purple. Okay. So the type one subsequent event is an event that happens after the end of the financial period. Let's just say here. And it relates to something that existed at the end of the year. So let's say it relates back to a transaction that happened at that point. Okay, that is what we call a type 1 subsequent event. A type 2 subsequent event is something I discover here, but relates to something that occurs after the end of the financial year. Okay, so type 1 events have to be things related to the financial period. Type 2 events are things that happen after the end of the financial period. Now, I'm actually going to write on these slides, this slide, some of the stuff that's printed on the other one so that I can show you on this diagram. So I'm going to go back to the purple. So if I have a type 1 subsequent event and I find out something that might affect an actual transaction that happened during the year, then I'm likely to need to adjust the financial statements. Okay. If I have a type 2 subsequent event, something that happens here, then I can't make an adjustment because it didn't actually happen during the financial year that I'm looking at. But what I may be required to do is to make a disclosure all right, in the notes to the accounts. Or the other option is I might need to do nothing this year. All right. But potentially, maybe next year, consider what the impact is. All right. So type one, the purple ones, I have to make an adjustment. Type two, the orange ones, I might make a disclosure or do nothing. Let me show you some examples. So type one, customer that we had at Odin Accounts Receivable. So let me just put this in the right color. So they add an accounts receivable at the 30th of June, but then they go bankrupt, which means that'll affect what I think will be a doubtful debt next year. All right, so I have to adjust my provisions. Okay. Um, another example is that at the 30th of June, the company looks like it's financially solid, but then after that, something bad happens and the company's going downhill, which means that they might not continue as a going concern next year. So that would be a, a type 1 subsequent event. And all of those, the key there is make the adjustment to the financial report. That usually involves changing some sort of number. All right. Now, 
what happens if I find one of these events after the date of the order? Oh, actually, no, I will click ahead to some other information. Okay, I'm going to do that previous slide in a, in a fresh diagram. Um, now, what happens if I have type 2 subsequent events? This is the ones that happen after the end of the financial year and they do not result in changes to any dollar amounts, but we talked about making disclosures or do nothing. So let's say that on the 15th of July, the factory burns to the ground. All the inventory is gone. It's not insured. Technically, at the 30th of June, inventory is there and you have to record it. But after that, the inventory has been destroyed at which point it's a good idea to tell your shareholders that there's been a big issue. Okay? Um, other things could be buying a business, going into a joint venture. You'd certainly want to make some disclosures if a big business event happened. And you'd include that because these subsequent events will help the decision makers, help users make their decisions about what to do in the future. Do I buy, do I sell, or do I hold my shares? Now, what are my responsibilities? And I think, hang on, let me just check something. I am going to add an extra slide here because the, the text here is, is not really a good way to explain this as uh, f for you guys. So I love my diagram, so let's draw a diagram here. All right. This is my timeline. Okay, here I've got my end of financial year. All right. Here I've got my date I sign my audit report. And here I've got the date I sign the financial statements are released. Okay. Now, in practice, this is the 30th of June. This is usually sometime in September or October, a very early October, but mostly September. This time, that point is usually one day after here. Right. In the textbooks, they often say this period is like two weeks. But in reality, auditors sign the audit report, it gets scanned into the financial statements, and then it gets released on the website the same day. All right, but I'm just spreading them out here so that we can and look at this. All right, so we have two types of periods. We have three different periods, and I'm going to do these in three different colors. Let's do the green one first. Okay. This period here is the period I'm going to call period one. All right, and this is, um, and I'm breaking these up in accordance with how the auditing standard breaks them up. So I'm pretty sure that in ASA 560, this is paragraph six through to eight. I'm pretty sure, I'll have to double check. Okay, the next period I'm gonna color in is this period here. Which I'm going to call period two. All right. So period two, and I'm talking about here when I events that I might discover during the audit. And then I'm going to call this one over here period three. Oops. Yep, yeah, that's right. Okay. So these different periods are three different periods in which I may discover an event. All right, so I'll do the green ones first. Let's say I discover an event here that relates to a transaction back here. Okay, so it relates to a transaction back here. I have to make an adjustment. All right, because this is a type one because it relates back to something that happened during the financial period. In P1, my auditor's obligation is that I must search for subsequent events. I have to look for them. I have to look for them in board meeting minutes, in newspaper articles, in budgets, in discussions with management. Now, in P1, I discover something here and it relates to something that happened at that point, let me extend my gray lines a little bit down there. Okay. For this one, is this a type one or a type two event? Type two. 
So here I would just have, whoops, wrong color. I would just have my disclosure, but that one would be an adjustment. How are we going? Everyone still with me? Okay. I'm going to get complicated with the colors now. Period two is the date between when I sign my audit report and the date the financial statements are released. Okay. Now I'm going to use the, my little typing thing here. In the orange and red sections, I only have to investigate things that are brought to the auditor's, whoops, where's the colon? Attention. Okay. And that goes over both of those. So it's sort of like half red, uh, half orange there. So while in this period, I have to search for subsequent events, here I'm not searching. I only investigate something and I check out whether there's an adjustment or a disclosure if someone brings it to my attention. Okay, here I have to look for them. Here I'm waiting for them to come to me. So if I go back to uh, here, I might discover an event here that relates to something over here. Type one or type two? Type two, and that's gonna be disclosure only or technically potentially do nothing. If I discover something, if something comes to my attention here that relates back to the financial period, then I'm going to need to make my adjustment. Now this is where it gets a bit tricky because at this point I've already signed the audit report. All right, management have already, so I go back to management and I say, can you make an adjustment please? If they say yes, we go great and we sign a fresh new audit report. If they say, no, I'm not going to make the change, then I'm going to have to modify my opinion, give them one of those opinions that says everything is not correct. All right, this is, this is where it gets a little bit complicated and it brings a few different things in at once. Okay, period three are things that happen after the end of the financial state, after the financial statements are released. So let's say you're at the annual general meeting and somebody raises a question and you become aware of something. Then, you have to investigate whether it has any impact back here. So, in this one, if I discover something or something is brought to my attention that relates to here, I don't actually have to do anything. Do nothing. I should try N for do nothing. But if I find something here that relates back here, I have an issue. The client has issued the financial statements. They've gone out with the audit report where we've said everything was correct, but we found something that needs to be fixed. In that instance, I have to notify ASIC. I have to recall the financial statements. I get the client to make an announcement on the ASX that says, everyone don't look at the financial statements we just released a few years, days ago. There's an issue. And they'll pull it off their website. Now, recall and revise doesn't mean that you ask all of the shareholders to send their copy back to you so that you can put it through the shredder. You just make an announcement that says, hey, don't look at it. And then you need to go back and investigate. All right. And if management agree to make the adjustment, you say, great, we issue fresh financial statements and a fresh audit opinion. If management say, oh, you found something, but I refuse to make the change, then you go to ASIC and you say, hey, they refuse to make the adjustments. We've got a big issue. Um, so I've drawn this in a sort of a, a different way. I, I tried this this morning and it seems like a good option. On YouTube, um, on Amanda Loves to Audit on the YouTube site, there is one of these, but it gives you a decision tree, like a bit of a flow diagram. Um, so make sure you watch the video and almost everybody writes the flow diagram in their audit handbook. So that's just a tip, write the flow diagram in your audit handbook. Um, but that is the basics of this standard, um, which is ASA 560, I better write the name down for you. Now, I told you that ASA 570 has this really nice little diagram in the back that everyone can follow. I don't know why there isn't one in ASA 560. I don't know if it's because it doesn't fit on the page because it's quite a big thing. When you see me draw it, I draw it on this A3 sheet of paper and it's quite complicated. Um, 
But watch the video because in the video I show you excerpts from the standards, I show you how to interpret the legal wording, and then how that fits into this option here. Okay, that's going to be really important for next week's homework. Um, I think it's pa paragraph 6 to 8. I think this one is 10 to 12. And then I think this one is 14 to 18. There's three, it's a very short standard, but it can be a little bit complicated if you've never read it. So please make sure that uh, you look at that for subsequent events. What sort of things does the auditor have to do to find subsequent events? We talk to management, we think about the business, we look at newspaper articles, we look on their Facebook page, we look on social media, all sorts of places for subsequent events. Uh, so it's more places where you can get information, talk to lawyers. If the company's being sued, that's a common one. You, know, you sell something during the year and then someone tries to sue you in August because the product, I don't know, left them blind or killed somebody or, I don't know, ruined their memory or whatever it might be, turned their face blue, whatever it could be. Now, uh, okay, let me just, I just realized I forgot to log on to show you this. Okay. All right, while that's waiting to load, uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about the adjustment process. And um, in the video, Fiona will talk about, if that ever works, um, she talks about how if you find errors, like somebody typed the wrong number in, management are pretty keen to change those. They'll be like, that's fine, that's a mistake, we'll fix that where management are less likely to make adjustments is where we have a difference in judgment. I think the impairment should be done one way. Somebody else thinks the impairment should be done a different way. We might disagree on depreciation, on a salvage value, um, or on how much a joint venture's you know, uh, profits should be apportioned. I got that confused thing forever. But it's not a simple process of here, client, here are all my adjustments and errors that I found and I think you should change, and them going, yes, thank you, I'll make all your changes. They will dig their heels in and say, I'm pretty sure what I've got is right. Prove to me why I should listen to you. Um, so it can be a fierce negotiation process. All right? It's not as simple as um, just, you know, just handing them across. Um, so much so there's a, a huge body of literature that was pioneered at the University of New South Wales by Professor Ken Trotman on audit negotiation. Um, and a lot of that comes from Ken's work and work out of the um, University of Illinois, I think, and some out of USC, where they evaluate negotiation styles um, and how auditors negotiate. And it's quite an important skill. And I know that a lot of new audit partners are actually sent on negotiation training to learn how to read someone across the table from you because you don't want to stand there and just go, make the changes because that's probably not going to go down very well. That's my uh, son at the moment. He is currently obsessed with Toy Story as well as the movie Cars. And in Toy Story, Woody says to Buzz, you are just a toy in that demanding sort of voice every time Buzz seems to think he's really a space ranger. And he's using that in his everyday request for things. Mummy, I need a biscuit. Oh, well, that's not going to get you anywhere. So um, obviously we need to think about obviously having manners, uh, negotiation style. Um, and there are certain styles of negotiation that are you know, more win-win and less adversarial. Let me see if I can get this video working. It may not. Come on. Uh, I've got problems getting it to play, but I'll put the link on um, UTS Online for you so you can watch Fiona talk about the negotiation process. Now, what are misstatements? We know that we spend our audit looking for misstatements and their differences in the financial report compared to what we think. Now, this, the little lecture notes here actually give a bit of an interesting perspective because they say misstatements are differences between what is reported by management and the correct reporting as required by the standards. Now there is a bit of an issue there, or well, not really an issue, but it's, it's, it's uh, well I suppose it's an issue, is that when it comes to standards, everybody is doing this. 
everybody is making their own interpretation. All right? And accounting policies give us choice. My choice might not be the same choice that managers make, and we may have disagreements. Can we, on some things, we can be fairly sure that there's a black and white correct answer, but on others, a lot of it is interpretation. All right. So we need to figure out which ones are black and white errors and which ones are interpretation, where it could be the battle of the experts, the auditor's expert versus the client's expert. When I'm looking at misstatements, um, I need to think about, could there be other ones that I haven't found? Is there any effect, especially on any debt covenants that the client might have? What sort of error is it? An error or a judgmental misstatement? The error, management is more likely to go, okay, all right, I'll make a change there. But the judgmental misstatement is where the client is more likely to question you and say, oh, I don't know if I agree with what your decision is there or what you suggest. Is there a turnaround effect? Did you make a loss this year, or sorry, the previous year, and a profit this year? Could there be any manipulation to get you to that profit? Could any issues be recurring issues, so ones that come back up again? And that sort of uh, links us through to you know, internal control issues. And then are there any circumstances we need to be especially careful of? Was there fraud? Was there anything illegal going on? If you're Volkswagen, this is something you're going to be pretty concerned about. Right? If I'm auditing Volkswagen, I'm thinking, what sort of liabilities are you going to have in terms of payouts to people that sue you, um, fines from government uh, agencies? There's a whole raft of errors coming for Volkswagen. 7-Eleven, God, if you're 7-Eleven and the wages fraud thing, I'd have like red flags and alarm bells ringing everywhere. Now, how do I know what is material and what is important and what needs adjustment? How does it affect the financial report? Is it a big dollar value item? Is it something that's part of a key performance indicator or a key industry performance indicator? What do users want to see? Now, sometimes if you have lots of institutional users, super funds, managed funds, they actually say to the auditor, these are the things we're worried about. All right, or they say in their reports, here are the things of the annual report that we find important. Um, so it's important that you as the auditor know those. Um, is there any effect on segments? A misstatement might not look big on its own in the consolidated accounts, but in your segment reporting, that could show up as an issue. And uh, is there any offsetting? Um, so you know, an offsetting is sometimes called netting of misstatements. If I have a $40,000 overstatement in inventory and a $50,000 understatement, can I look at the net of those? What if I have overstatements in operating expenses, but understatements in marketing expenses, can I net those and offset them? Well, there are some rules on offsetting um, within the standards. For current year misstatements, I want to uh, see if there's any effect on future years, because something immaterial this year could balloon into material next year. And then I want to look at the prior year, because something that was immaterial last year could become material this year. Uh, for example, understated payables last year could become a double-sized error this year, especially if you go from negatives to positives, understatements to overstatements within or swing between them in years. Now, this one's a really key one. You need to consider... Ooh! Erase, erase, erase. I meant to turn that on slightly opaque. There you go. Quantitative and qualitative aspects, all right? Now, the qualitative stuff, what does qualitative mean? Oh, sorry, quantitative. What does quantitative mean? Big numbers, right? How big it is, dollar signs, numbers. Okay? So, quantitative is all in relation to that materiality that we said at the planning stage in our audit, 150,000, 2 million, whatever it might be. Qualitative are those non-financial factors. So things like how close are we to a debt covenant? Something might not be a very big error, but it might get the company out of breaching a debt covenant, which might make it material. Is it related to bonuses and incentives? What if it goes from a profit to a loss or vice versa? 
So some misstatements will try and turn losses into profits to sneak them above the line. Um, and what about whether it might affect key ratios that are monitored by analysts? And the profit and loss one is quite interesting. There are some, there's some research out there which shows that if this, all right, that's zero dollars, okay? This is loss down here, and this is profit up here. And I'll draw some bars to represent sort of different companies, or different kind. All right, so obviously you have lots of companies that make a very big profit, okay? But when you look at, and I'm just guessing what's here, but when you look at what's around zero, you see this. All right. So what, what is really interesting in the uh, research is that nobody makes a very little loss or zero profit. Everybody tends to make just a tiny bit. All right. And this is a pretty key sign that everybody is legally manipulating or managing their earnings to just squeak over the line. Um, uh, I should actually find the, the graph for that, the, the proper graph from the research there, published in, I think it was a finance journal, but it's now become a, a big accounting thing. So we have to make our opinions. And we have three different standards, I'll do this in green, uh, that go with our opinions. ASA 700, which is for opinions that are unqualified, 705 and 706, okay? So 700 is our unqualified opinions. Unqualified, remember, is all correct. 705 is once where we found an error, and 706 is for when we're disclosing other information. All right, now to make my opinion, I have to have evidence, I need to make sure it's sufficient and appropriate. Management have made their adjustments and they're telling me what they're not going to change so that I can make my decision on which of these two audit opinion types I'm going to give them. What goes into the report? This is pretty standard, right? So if you look in ASA 700, there's actually like copy and paste stuff there. What is interesting is that here, management actually, we state, management, it is your responsibility for what goes into the report. I can advise, I can suggest, I can threaten you or, you know, try and coerce you into reporting certain things. But as managers, it is your final decision on what goes in. They don't have to listen to us. They can choose not to listen to us. It's management's responsibility. The auditor clearly describes what their responsibility is, and they usually state there that they are providing reasonable assurance and that it's not a guarantee. And then we give the important part, which is our opinion. Okay? <coughs> the other thing that's important is the independent statement. And that comes from the Corporations Act, which requires the auditor to provide a certificate of independence um, so that if something happens and you were found not to be independent, you've breached a signed document in your audit report. And that makes it easy for ASIC to take you to court. Oh, you clearly signed that you're independent. Oh, here's the evidence that shows that you were not independent. Failed to comply with the uh, Corporations Act. But also, comes out of, as well, APES 110, which is our ethical standards on independence. Uh, and now, there's a bit of an error here. Let me change this. Auditor's signature. Firm name and personal name. All right. So, Jane Smith of KPMG. Um, so we have, in Australia, under the Corporations Act, it says depending on legislative requirements, in Australia, firm name and personal name. So we can track which audit partners are making which decisions. All right, so when we modify the audit report, that is, they're not true and fair. So this is the situation where we say not true and fair, which means there are, management have refused to make adjustments. Okay, and I'm going to go through a table that talks about which of those options. 
Now, sometimes you can add an emphasis of matter paragraph, and this can go with add to any opinion. All right, so it can add on, you can add this on to the unqualified everything is correct opinion, but the emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraphs are simply you waving your hand and saying, hey, shareholders, there's extra information we want to make you aware of. All right. Yes, management may be telling the truth or no, they might have some things they're hiding, but I want to draw your attention to something. So that's the emphasis of matter paragraph. Now, I'm going to go to the, uh, where's the diagram? This one, because this really summarizes what's on those previous slides. This is another one of those places where I'm going to want you to tab your handbook. Okay, you'll find this table in ASA 705 in the appendices. All right, do not recopy this table into your handbook. When people recopy this table into their handbook, I know that they haven't read the handbook because otherwise you would have just tabbed the page. So let's go through the two reasons why management um, may not have made a um, why we might give them a report that says the financial statements are not true and fair. So the first one is the financial report is materially misstated. Now that means either two things. There's a dollar value error or they failed to make an appropriate disclosure. Failure to disclose is just as significant as failure to have the correct number. All right. So, we, step one, is it an instance where there's either a dollar error or a disclosure error? Yes. All right. It has to be material. So if it's material but not pervasive, what does pervasive mean? Spread throughout. Spread throughout. Okay. So imagine you've got an octopus and you've laid out the uh, financial statements on uh, a piece of, two pieces of paper you plonk the octopus on top, right? His tentacles or her tentacles are going to be touching the revenue area, expenses, assets, liabilities. So the idea of pervasive, I like to think of as the octopus, right? That's always a good visual reminder, pervasive and octopus. But what if it's a material error? They've understated inventory, but that's really the only thing. It's inventory and cogs, but everything else is fine then we say it's not pervasive and the opinion we will give is a qualified one. All right, we say everything is correct except for this one thing. All right. If there's lots of errors spread throughout the financial statements and we think, oh gosh, the errors are like the octopus, then I've got an adverse opinion where I'm actually saying there are lots of things wrong and I'm actually going to list them in the audit report. So that's the first reason. A dollar value incorrect or there's a failure to disclose. The second reason is that we cannot get sufficient and appropriate evidence. All right, we cannot meet the requirements of ASA 500 paragraph 5, which says I must get enough of the right sort of things. If it's only for one area but not throughout the accounts, qualified opinion. Everything is correct except for inventory we couldn't observe because it was too far away in a foreign country burn down. This one here, the disclaimer of opinion, is where I can't get information over a really, really wide scale. Um, and we certainly gave out within the audit industry disclaimers of opinions for a lot of companies that were housed in the Twin Towers in New York, in the World Trade Center, right? Because in those instances, often there is no computer records. There are no people to talk to. Um, so in those instances, we give a disclaimer of opinion. We say, actually, I can't give you an opinion because I can't get access to enough evidence. Most of the time, I've not seen many of these um, outside of cases where um, directors and employees are trying to really do the wrong thing. So have you guys heard of Rene Rivkin? No. So Rene Rivkin was a very famous Australian businessman. He was a high flyer, spent lots of money on flashy cars, all that sort of thing died uh, from committing suicide, but he gave, he 
refused to give the auditors access to crucial information to allow them to complete their audit opinion. And in the case, one of his companies received the disclaimer of opinion. He went so far as he took all the documents, flew them to a Swiss bank vault, and then locked them there so that the auditor couldn't get access to them. So this we don't see very often. Now, what I've got for you on UTS Online is in this week's folder a whole sample of these sorts of reports. All right, so I want you to go on and they're in PDF form. All you have to do is click and just have a look at them to see what they say in the qualified sections, the adverse sections, and the disclaimer sections. Okay? <coughs> now, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, what color will I use? I suppose I'll use red. This one here, which is ASA 706, which says sometimes I want to give people extra information. And that could be if the company is struggling financially. I don't think they're going to make it over the next 12 months. If something else is happening, like, you know, oh, the, the client has just uh, sunk $2 billion into a joint venture with North Korea, I would go, well, I'm not sure that's really money that's well spent. Uh, that might affect viability. Um, if there is inconsistent other information. Now, the other information is the glossy information at, for the rest of the annual report, right? The financial report is a very small component of the annual report. So what if the company's making a loss, but in the front of the annual report, they're saying about how profitable the company is or how sales are up and profits are up. Then we might want to say, hang on a second. That doesn't really match up. Or if we have a subsequent event, a new joint venture, a new loan, a breakthrough in something that might mean changes in the business. Um, a, an example of the going concern, has everybody seen the movie Avatar with the blue people? Oh, that one. Yeah, no, no, not um, Avatar like as in um, the last airbender Avatar, as in the blue people Avatar, right? So in Avatar, it's obviously it's a mining company that is mining the planet for a particular mineral. Does anyone remember what it was called? Unobtainium. I don't know whether like they <laughs> I don't know what James Cameron's thinking there, but unobtainium was the name of the mineral. So if you made something that had to have unobtainium and you could no longer get unobtainium because the native inhabitants of the blue of the planet, those big blue people, have kicked you off in a pitched battle that made billions at the box office, then you're going to have to raise an issue of going concern. You're going to have to say to shareholders, and management will say this, and the auditor will say this, hi, everybody, we're, we're on a bit of shaky financial ground. And I'm just warning you that the company may not survive the next 12 months. All right. So that's what you might do if there are some issues. Now, what happens if the company breaches the Corporations Act? The client has to report themselves. And if they don't report themselves, we report them. Um, and as soon as you find out it happens, you should tell them. So you must be in a timely manner. Do not wait till the end of the engagement, which could be two or three months later, especially if they've been trading while insolvent. There's been fraud because, you know, if you wait three months to tell ASIC, the person might have skipped out of town and gone to Mallorca in Spain with all the company's money before ASIC gets in. So you need to make sure that uh, you tell them. And if there's late lodgement. Now, most companies schedule their lodgement and their release of financial reports with the stock market, right? CBA and St. George don't release on the same day. Woolies and Coles don't release on the same day. If your financial report is not going to be good, you release on Friday at 4.59 with the hopes that everybody's gone home or is at the pub. If you've got great news, you might release early in the morning to capture the morning news cycle, the you know, drive radio, breakfast TV, and then that gets printed sort of you know, on websites and things later on. But it's a real strategy game as to when you're going to report um, how many people are you going to leak that to, all sorts of other information. But you do need to make sure that you report within the deadlines. We do have to talk with management about our findings. 
All right. So if there's been fraud or they've not complied with uh, laws and regulations, you have to tell, it, tell them as soon as we find out. But at the end of the audit, we tend to give them at the end of the audit, here we go, end of the audit, we give them something called a management letter. Okay, the management letter is a letter from the auditor and inside that management letter, we talk to them about the misstatements we found. We might talk to them about the fraud issues or any legal issues. We talk to them about internal controls. <coughs> and if we found any internal controls issues or if we've had any difficulties with collecting evidence. All right. So we try and give them some value add. Everybody hates the auditor because like, oh, it's this legal thing I have to do. Who here has dealt with auditors at work? It's annoying, right? They come, they ask for all these documents, and they say, show me how you do this process, and where does this number come from, and whose signature is this, and can I get this document from 15 months ago, and you go, ah, I just want to do my work. Right? I can see all the people where they're nodding, right? bloody auditors. So while clients get annoyed, you want to try and give them some value add, feel like they're getting something. So typically we give them a management letter and a presentation that summarizes to your audit committee and your executives. Here's what we've done. Here are some internal control weaknesses that you could plug and that could make your audit cheaper next year. Here are some you know, people that might have, oh look, this accountant was really not helpful. All right, so you might tell them that um, and you'll tell them about any misstatements that you've adjusted, uh, that they've adjusted and things that you've had some contention about. You know, oh, well, you know, we disagreed on valuation of executive stock options. That might be something that you need to think about next year and we need to think about. Um, so we all talk about also all these other things, um, what we expect to give them in the audit report. Um, we've talked about non-compliance with laws, any other issues. Of course, we have to document everything that we do. All our communication with management needs to be documented. Um, we actually ask management for something called a management representation letter. All right, and that has its own standard, which I th think might be ASA 280. I'd need to double check. But the management representation letter is a letter where management actually say, all the things that we've told you verbally that there's no other evidence for, we've given you the truth and we've given you all of the information. All right. So sometimes if you can't get documentary evidence and all you've got is verbal, you'll ask them for the management representation letter. But we document everything that we do. You know, I, I don't know what I... I'm pretty sure two weeks ago I would have had porridge for breakfast because I almost always have porridge for breakfast. But unless I documented it, I wouldn't entirely, be entirely sure. So documentation is critical in case of one of these. And they say, prove you did the right thing and your documentation is going to be the only thing that saves you. So that's it this week. What's happening next week? Summary lecture. Um, so there's no new content. I'm going to do a summary. Um, but, you know, we've been doing the weekly context thing, so everybody's pretty good. But I'll, I'll give a quick overview. There's going to be a little fun interactive quiz. Um, there's Wi-Fi in the room, so if you've got an internet-enabled device, bring it along with you because we're going to do some stuff online. Um, fill in the video interview survey, the last survey. It's right at the very bottom of the page. I only added it this week. And uh, next week we're going to draw three winners um, of a $50 gift card. And then there'll also be like Ask Amanda, which will be open slather to ask questions. You won't have to put your hand up. We'll actually do it through technology. So you're, there'll actually be a little website where you can ask questions. If you don't want to raise your hand or you feel a bit silly asking it, put it up there. You can ask questions about audit. You can ask questions about anything else that I might be able to help you with. I don't know, using a Thermomix, toilet training a three-year-old, almost three-year-old, career choices, CA versus CPA, whatever you want to ask me. Um, I'll do my best to try and help you out. Engineering, law, finance subjects, I can't help you there. But you know, if you have general life-ish sort of questions, I'm happy to give those a shot. Last question, CA 
Ahmed versus CPA. Just on a